Well, first I'd like to thank GAR for setting up such a wonderful set of programs. I have an easy job. All I have to do is follow what he has already set up for me. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Our guest speaker tonight is Sarah Byerly. She's an author, speaker, and researcher focusing on the American Civil War. Her presentation tonight delves into the personal stories of Colonel Robert Franklin Beckham and Lieutenant Justin E. Dimmick as she examines their um, uh, efforts uh, with their artillery in the Battle of Chancellorsville. Sarah Byerly is currently the managing editor of Emerging Civil War, while also working on the, in the educational department of American Battlefield Trust. She has published several historical novels and a nonfiction book on the Battle of Newmarket. We're lucky enough to have her be able to stay after this evening and sign books if anybody is interested. She'll be sitting um, right down here at the front table. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest speaker tonight, Sarah Byerly. Good evening. How's the volume? All right, I don't hear any complaints. Um, thank you, Anne, for the introduction, and thank you to the members and the officers here at Brunswick Civil War Roundtable for inviting me to come and be with you tonight. Um, it was a wonderful drive down. I live in the Fredericksburg area of Virginia, and I'm delighted to be here tonight with you. Let me uh, open my water bottle because my allergies have been a little rough this week, so I want to try to avoid coughing through the program. All right, as Ann has told you, tonight we're going to be talking about some young artillerymen who are at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And I first came across their stories a couple years ago. Um, I found Justin Dimmick when I was doing some research on the West Point class of 1861. Let's try to get started here. So the road runs east-west, and the road that we're talking about today is a busy highway in Virginia called Route 3, where the cars speed by. But in 1863, it was called the Orange Turnpike or the Plank Road, and it bisected the battleground where the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia and the Federal Army of the Potomac fought in the opening days of May 1863. Eventually separated by approximately a mile to a mile and a half of road, two young artillery officers placed guns along the turnpike. Their stories connected by the road through the wilderness uh, the wilderness land and a full-scale battle offer a chance to look at their battle experiences. The Battle of Chancellorsville altered the lives of both young men. Justin Dimmick, the unlikely soldier who had been kicked out of West Point twice, uh, and Robert F. Beckham, Robert Franklin Beckham, a rising star in the Stuart Horse Artillery, who takes command at a challenging time and would forever remain in the shadow of his predecessor. Tonight, we're going to explore their stories, their leadership journeys, and their combat effectiveness as young artillery officers in one of the decisive battles of the American Civil War. We'll talk briefly about their pre-war lives, and then we'll take a closer look at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And what I'm sharing tonight is accurate and citable to the best of my knowledge, but there's always more that we'll probably find in the research files, and hopefully there'll be more primary sources that will come to light um, uh, related to these young men, which may get more questions answered. Next slide, please. So meet Robert Beckham. He is born May 6th, 1837 in Culpeper, Virginia. I've not been able to find out a lot about his childhood. Um, he would have been well educated because he's going to go to West Point, the United States Military Academy. There also has to be some level of influence that his family has or someone that they know because like now in the modern era, it was the same back then, you need an appointment 
from a congressman to go to the military academy. So that gives us a little bit of clues into what his youth might have been. Next slide, please. We know that Beckham entered West Point in 1854, and he is in a unique position because he's actually going to be at the military academy for five years. Now, today and in most of West Point's military history, the course was for four years. But in the 1850s, Jefferson Davis, has, who was Secretary of War at the time, not yet President of the Confederacy, he, intr he introduces a new idea of a five-year course of study at West Point. And Beckham and Dimmick are going to be kind of caught in that system, that five years at the academy. The majority of cadets did not like it probably understandably, but Beckham is one of those that will spend five years at the academy and not because he did anything wrong. Um, if his experience was like most cadets of that class, he would have had two furloughs um, where he would have been al allowed to go and see his family. Most of his years would have been consumed with rigorous academics. And then there's the milita military training that happens at West Point, and there's an emphasis on horsemanship, on fencing, on learning about artillery, engineering, um, a lot of those skills that were needed in mid-19th century military. There was a demerit system, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with from other programs or presentations, but this is when a cadet broke the rules, he would get demerits, and if you had enough of bad demerits, well, those are going to stack up and it might mean extra guard duty or other forms of punishment. Um, Justin Dimmick is going to get a lot of demerits, and we'll talk about him in a few moments. But as for Beckham, while he probably had his share of escapades and demerits, apparently they were not very legendary ones. Uh, Beckham's class includes Joseph Wheeler, who will be a Confederate cavalry commander, and Edward Stoughton, who is infamous for being captured by John Mosby during the Civil War. Now, Beckham is at West Point when Justin Dimmick arrives, but they are not in the same class. Robert Beckham, next slide, please. Robert Beckham graduates honorably. He's in the class of 1859, and he ranks sixth out of 22 in his class. His entire class will see action in the American Civil War, and five out of his class will join the Confederacy. The highest ranking um, newly commissioned second lieutenants, um, so based on your class rank, um, in the West Point graduating classes, they got the top picks of where you, to get the, the more exciting, the better positions, if you will, in the U.S. military. And most of the top of the classes would pick the U.S. engineers. And Beckham is ranking high enough in his class that he gets that option, and unsurprisingly, he picks the topographical engineers. Next slide. So we're going to leave Robert Beckham for just a moment, now that we've got him through West Point, and meet Justin Dimmick. Now, you might be looking at the picture on the slide and thinking, hmm, that does not look like Justin Dimmick Jr., or that is a very strange picture. Um, that is a correct assumption to make. That is a picture of his father. Um, Justin Dimmick Jr. is born on November 1st, 1839. He's one of 14 children. His father was a colonel and later a, bre a brevet brigadier general who had gained a respected reputation during the Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848. And his father is heavily involved in military service of the 1st United States Artillery. Um, he'll actually command it from a headquarters pos post in Boston during the Civil War itself. And the first U.S. artillery is part of the Dimmick family heritage, if you will, at this time in their, pardon me, in their history. So his father has influence, his father has rank in the standing United States Army. That's going to play a role in the first part of Justin Dimmick's story. Next slide, please. Dimmick is going to enter West Point in 1856. He'll also be there five years. His class, which is set to graduate in 1861, includes some famous names like Alonzo Cushing, George Custer, Patrick O'Rourke. His class will have 34 officers graduate out of it or be set to graduate out of it. Um, four of them will go south and join the Confederacy. Next slide, please. 
probably the most dramatic part about Justin Dimmick's story in his early days is he gets kicked out of West Point twice. And I already kind of gave that to you as a spoiler and you saw it in the teaser for the program. So what happened? Well, he, he acquires a lot of demerits. Um, he was known as a ringleader for mischief. He's repeatedly climbing out of windows to go to the local tavern, which is called Benny Havens. Other cadets did this as well, but it seems like Dimmick was exponentially in trouble. He also kind of rebels against authority in very, very visible ways. He did not want to be in his, his ethics class one day, and the cadets were in their classroom <coughs> waiting for the professor to arrive, and Dimmick stands up, grabs a book, and he makes this little speech, which I've put in text on the screen. He says, the virtues are what we are, the duties are what we do. What we are is more important than what we do. Th thus, the virtues are more important than the duties. And then he hurls his textbook across the room. It smashes into a window, and the professor walks in right at that moment. That was what led to the dismissal the first time around. Dimmick is ordered to pick up the glass from the broken window and return to his room under arrest. So he gets dismissed from West Point, but his father, remember his father has that reputation from the Mexican-American War, he gets him back into West Point. So you would think, if you've been kicked out once and your dad got you back in, you might straighten up your act. Not Justin. He gets kicked out again in March 1859. And guess what? Dad gets him back in. So he must have had a reputation as one of those cadets. Dad'll bail him out. Dad'll keep him in the military. So imagine what that must have been like to be at West Point with that reputation and then to commission as a second lieutenant with that reputation. Next slide, please. Well, Dimmick graduates, finally. <laughs> He's in the class of June 1861. There is a class that graduates in May 1861, so we've got two classes of 1861. Um, but Dimmick does graduate. He, he commissions a second lieutenant, and he's low ranking in his class status. Not many surprises there, so he goes into the infantry, um, sixth U.S. infantry to be precise. But it looks like his dad pulled a few more strings, and before long, he gets transferred and promoted to first lieutenant in the first U.S. artillery, which is a unit where his father has a lot of influence. Next slide, please. <laughs> Dimmick graduates when the Civil War has already started. Sorry about that. So he graduates and the Civil War has already started. Fort Sumter is fired upon on April 12, 1861. His class graduates in June 1861. So there are already volunteer armies rushing to be formed. And the West Point officers, particularly those in the classes that graduate close to the date of the Civil War, they have this opportunity. Can they make a name for themselves? The classes that graduate closest to the war have a lot of junior officers that you will find in the ranks of the armies. Some of these junior officers will rise high through promotion, some will not. But what's happening with the Civil War is you have these young officers going into a situation that is not a static army. So there's not anyone frozen, so to speak, waiting to promote. There's opportunity, there's troops to command, there's positions to hold. So there's a lot of opportunity for motivated young men. Also, keep in mind the Confederacy, the states that have seceded, they want West Point cadets. They want West Point graduates. So you'll see quite a few of the cadets who have come from the southern states return to their home states and fight for the Confederacy, of course. And that's where you're going to have the sectionalism and um, the state emphasis come in particularly. Next slide, please. 
a little bit of th a few things to think about with artillery before we go into what Beckham and Dimmick do during the Civil War itself. So sometimes military history will talk about the art of war or how a war is fought. Um, artillery is an art. Artillery in this era is also a science. And grimly said, it is a science for killing. Um, you have projectiles coming out of these large cannons. You have solid shot. You have sh exploding shells. You have canister that is devastating against infantry, against anything in its path. But I think sometimes it's easy to picture the cannons up out of, you know, immediate danger. You know, they're out on the high ground, the infantry's down in front, the artillery's, you know, firing perhaps from a distance. But the tactics require artillery to fight artillery, as well as artillery is going to fight infantry and cavalry uh, um, as well. So when you have artillery fighting artillery, like we're going to have at Chancellorsville a little bit later in the program, that is where your commander is looking through his field glasses and spotting the enemy guns, spotting the enemy battery, and he is ordering his gunners to adjust their range to fire on those enemy guns. Meanwhile, your enemy's trying to do the same thing to you. So these heavy projectiles are exploding the ground, possibly exploding caissons, possibly killing the horses that are needed to pull these heavy guns. So artillery can fight itself, if you will, under heavy bombardment, under heavy fire. And we're going to find an, uh, examples of that on many battlefields, and we'll look closer at Chancellorsville tonight. Cannons in the Civil War are not peaceful the way we see them on battlefields or in forts now. And just keep that in mind as we're talking about artillerymen, artillery officers. They are going into the thick of a fight, particularly these junior officers. Next slide, please. So we'll return to Robert Beckham and take a look briefly at what he's doing for the first two years of the war. So remember, he had graduated West Point. He's commissioned into the U.S. Engineers. He's going to resign that commission and go join the Confederacy. And he's one of those who resigns early because by March 1861, before the firing on Fort Sumter, but when a lot of states have already seceded, he commissions as an artillery lieutenant in what is called the Prov Provisional Confederate Army. He will see action at First Bull Run, First Manassas. Um, he is with the Newtown Artillery, and at that battle, he'll actually command the battery, multiple guns, since that battery's captain was away recruiting other artillerymen. In the winter of 1861 to 1862, Beckham transfers to the Jeff Davis Alabama Artillery. And then in January, on January 14, 1862, he becomes an ordnance officer on the staff of General Gustavus Smith, and with that pro position comes his promotion to major. Next slide, please. There's a unit that's forming and a unit that's going into battle without Beckham. But because they're going to be his unit and they're going to be his unit at Chancellorsville, I want to explain a little bit about their history. So the Stuart Horse Artillery. The concept of horse artillery, uh, this one took me a little while to figure out how to explain it because most cannons that you find on battlefields that are being maneuvered around are pulled by horses. So what's the difference between horse artillery and your regular field artillery? Because horses move both. The easy way to think of it is horse artillery accompanies cavalry. And your horse artillerymen are generally going to be mounted. So they will be able to ride along with the cannons. The purpose of horse artillery, it comes from the Napoleonic battlefields of Europe. And the idea is to have a very maneuverable gun, a very maneuverable battery that can go to an advanced position or go to some position where that heavier firepower is needed, fire off a couple of rounds, and then pull to a new position or retreat very quickly, having accomplished its objective. Confederate Cavalry Commander in Virginia, James Ewell Brown Stewart, better known as Jeb Stewart, wants horse artillery. That is one of his big goals in the autumn of 1861. And in November, he gets his wish. It's approved by the Confederate War Department, and he is also 
allowed to select his commander, subject to the approval of the Confederates' uh, military boards in Richmond. And his commander for the Stuart Horse Artillery is a young man named John Pelham. Should have graduated with Justin Dimmick in the class of 1861 from West Point, but Pelham has left West Point and returned to Alabama before graduation happens. John Pelham organizes, trains, and prepares what becomes known as the Stuart Horse Artillery. And in 1862, he takes the battery to the field for the first time. They'll see action on the peninsula, at Second Manassas, at Antietam, in the Loudoun Valley Campaign, and Pelham's high moment comes at the Battle of Fredericksburg. There's an artistic rendition of it on the screen. And throughout 1862, Pelham has been figuring out the tactics that he wants to use for horse artillery. It's a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, moving into those advanced positions, firing off a few shots, moving to a new position. Um, he's very effective with it, and he has very effective units, and he keeps growing the horse artillery. Um, there are quite a few batteries by the time spring 1863 comes around. Next slide, please. On March 17, 1863, John Pelham is mortally wounded at the Battle of Kelly's Ford. He dies later that night. There is a void in the command of the horse artillery in Stuart's cavalry. And Stuart has to make a decision. He has able commanders in the ranks of his horse artillery, men that uh, Pelham has trained, but Stuart looks elsewhere. He's looking for another commander. He's not quite ready to promote the guys in the ranks just yet. And on April 8, 1863, in General Orders No. 1, it says, in compliance with instructions from the commanding general, the horse artillery will cease to belong to brigade organizations, but will constitute a separate corps to operate with cavalry. Major R. F. Beckham is assigned to command the horse artillery of this army. Next slide, please. So Beckham takes command of Jeb Stuart's horse artillery, but he inherits a lot of problems. By the spring of 1863, the Confederates are struggling to keep horses healthy, to keep horses in the field, and to find new horses. As you might imagine, you need horses for horse artillery, and a lot of them. So he's going to run into some logistical problems right away. Beckham is also going to have to learn about his command. He's coming in as a new commander. He doesn't know these men that he will be working with. His command includes, and this is all horse artillery, the Lynchburg Beauregards under Captain Mormon, the original Stuart horse artillery, which is commanded by James Brethed, the Virginia Battery under Captain McGregor, and the Washington, South Carolina Artillery commanded by Captain Hart. So these are the battery commanders that Beckham has to learn to work with <coughs> as he takes his new command. And Beckham will, to some extent, particularly in Civil War memory, always be in John Pelham's shadow. I would venture to guess many of you in this room have heard of John Pelham, um, at least stories of him, maybe you've read biographies of him, but Beckham is one that we are not quite as familiar with. And some of that has to do with the time that Pelham dies, um, he's the first commander of the horse artillery, and Jeb Stuart uh, promotes Pelham's memory quite a bit after his death. Next slide. Justin Dimmick and his first two years of the war, he has a chance to rewrite his story. Can he earn a place with merit, not his dad's influence? He's become a first lieutenant, he's in the United, first United States artillery, and his early experience will start in 1861 when he drills recruits. He will also fight at the first Battle of Bull Run in July 1861. In February 1862, he becomes the adjutant for the first U.S. artillery, and he serves in that post in the safety of Washington, D.C. for most of the year. By spring 1863, though, he has taken command of Battery H of the first U.S. artillery. Next slide. The first U.S. artillery is a unit that can trace parts of its history back to the Revolutionary War. Until May 1864, so even beyond um, Dimmick's time with it, um, batteries E, G, H, 
I and K serve with the Army of the Potomac in the Eastern Theater. Um, other units will fight in the West and then eventually they all come East. Um, the headquarters of the artillery unit, because this is a standing unit, this is United States troops, this is not a volunteer formed unit, say, from the state of New York. So these are United States enlisted soldiers. Um, their headquarters does not go to war, and Justin Dimmick's father, Colonel and General Dimmick, commands part of it um, from his headquarters in Boston. As we come to the spring of 1863, Battery H is assigned to the 3rd Corps, 2nd Division Artillery um, in the Army of the Potomac. Next slide, please. Next slide, if possible. Thank you. <coughs> Dimmick, as a leader, he's had two years and he has to learn how to stand on his own. And it does seem that something shifts in his thinking and how he acts. His leadership grows, and his men come to respect him, and this is seen, the results of this are seen at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And when I look at Dimmick's life, it kind of makes me think of the Shakespeare quote from the play Hamlet. We know what we are, but we know not what we may be. So he has this transformation of character, if you will. His leadership grows. And this brings us, with both of artillery commanders, to May 1863 and the Chancellorsville campaign. Next slide, please. May 1863. The Union Army is still trying to advance on Richmond, capital of the Confederacy in uh, Virginia. There have been many movements trying to get to Richmond over the previous two years of war. And taking his turn at the advance is a new Union general named Joseph Hooker. Fighting Joe Hooker, as some call him. He and the Army of the Potomac will be going up against Robert E. Lee, who has already turned back several armies from their advances on Richmond in the past. On the screen, you can see some arrows, and I brought maps that have big arrows because I want to make it easy. You'll see a red circle there in the middle of the screen. That's representing where the Confederates are, Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia, although he has detached his first corps under command of James Longstreet. They've gone south to Suffolk due to a lack of forage in central Virginia. But Lee, with his army, is in the Fredericksburg area. And Hooker devises this plan. He's going to march up the Rappahannock River and come around and come in on Lee's rear. Meanwhile, those big sweeping arrows that you see on the screen, that represents his cavalry. He's going to detach the majority of his cavalry under George Stoneman and send them on a raid toward Richmond. <coughs> the campaign starts off well enough. Hooker makes his uh, army march up the river. They cross at multiple points. They're coming in on the rear of Lee's army. And this brings us to day one. Next slide, please. May 1st, 1863. Again, we're going to go high level here. Oh, good. The map is looking pretty good. So you can see the Union Army has marched around, it's coming in, and it's going to meet the Confederates because the Confederates are going to turn from Fredericksburg. They're going to turn west, marching out the Orange Turnpike, the Plank Road, and there's going to be a clash in what we call the first day fields of Chancellorsville. So fighting occurs on the first day of the battle, and Hooker stops. And he stops in the middle of the Virginia wilderness, which is a dense place, a lot of undergrowth, a lot of dense trees. And he halts, him, he, halts he makes his headquarters at a place called the Chancellor House, um, or the Chance, at the Chancellor Crossroads, which is one of the open areas in this Virginia wilderness. And you've got several roads that intersect there, so he's using the roads to bring his army together, but he stops in the middle of this wilderness, and that allows more Confederates to come into the area and continue this battle at Chancellorsville. And Hooker is not in a great position. Fighting in dense woods is probably not the best idea. For one thing, your artillery can't do much except light the woods on fire if you're firing into very dense trees. So artillery is important at the Battle of Chancellorsville, but where the ground is open, around the clearing of the Chancellorsville crossroads, out to the west where the Union 11th Corps sets up their um, camp. 
During the first day of the battle, um, Justin Dimmick, with his Battery H, 1st U.S. Artillery, is held in reserve between the railroad and the Lacey House in the early part of the campaign, but then he is going to move up, cross the river, and be coming across with the rest of the 3rd Corps, the infantry, and his the other batteries of artillery, moving into this fight that has stalled as the Union Army stops around the Chancellorsville crossroads. Meanwhile, the horse artillery is much more active. Their active days at the Battle of Chancellorsville are days one and days two. So if you look right in the middle of that map where there's a lot of blue and red lines coming together, the horse artillery goes into that area. They're firing toward the Chancellorsville clearing. Some of them will swing out to another area, and they're doing what horse artillery is supposed to do. Move to a location, launch a few shells, launch a few shots, pull back. They do suffer some casualties on day one. Next slide, please. Day two of the Battle of Chancellorsville, probably the most famous day of the battle uh, because it's the day that the famed flank attack happens. So Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his <laughs> Lieutenant General Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson will devise a plan to send Jackson's Corps of approximately 30,000 men on a securitist route to the west, and they're going to come in on the flank or the side of the Union Army and launch a surprise attack. Jackson's infantry, it takes most of the day for them to move about 12 miles to get into position for this attack. Meanwhile, Lee and the rest of the Confederate Army fights um, some delaying demonstrations to keep the Union Army kind of interested and busy. <coughs> the horse artillery has a role to play here, and that is blocking the road. So they're going to go out to the west, and the road that Jackson and the infantry will attack down later in the evening, that is where Beckham sets up two guns. And they're going to spend most of, most of, most of the day there waiting in advance, waiting for the infantry to come up, and the infantry will form the long lines of battle. Beckham writes a report for Chancellorsville, and he says, the horse artillery was moved over to the Orange Turnpike Road within a few hundred yards of where the enemy's right flank rested and held near this point until General Jackson's Corps came up and the attack was commenced. The ground at the point indicated is of such character as rendered it almost impossible to employ artillery except along the road and the enemy, to increase the difficulty, had blocked up the road at several point with fallen trees. So we find Beckham and a few of his guns where we would expect to find horse artillery. They are overlooking Union camps, camps of the 11th Corps that is sitting out in fairly unprotected ground. The Confederate infantry comes up, and in his official report from the battle, Robert E. Lee will say, the horse artillery accompanied the infantry and participated with credit to itself in the engagement. The nature of the country rendered it impossible for the cavalry to do more. So part of the highlight, if you will, for Confederate cavalry at Chancellorsville is what is accomplished by Beckham and the horse artillery. Next slide, please. At about 5.15 in the early evening, enough of the Confederate infantry has got into place. And Stonewall Jackson tells his generals, you can go forward then. The signal for the advance was the firing of two guns. There are two guns that are up in position at this time, and those are cannons commanded by Robert Beckham. According to Harris von Bork, a cavalry staff officer, Jackson's veterans bounded forward toward the astounded and perfectly paralyzed enemy, while the thunder of our horse artillery, on whom devolved the honor of opening the ball, reached us from the other extremity of the line. So positioned on the orange turnpike, firing the opening shots that kind of wake up the Yankees, if you will, is Beckham and two guns from his horse artillery. But that's not where their story ends. Next slide, please. As the Confederate infantry advances, and you can see long red lines on the screen <coughs> showing those lines of battle, these two guns with Beckham and from the horse artillery are going to advance along the road. Uh, 
they are moving at infantry pace, but according to Beckham, they are not able to keep up with the skirmishers, who are the very advanced men. But what does this look like? This is what horse artillery does. They're going to go along the road until they get to a slight eminence or slight rise, or maybe they'll pull off to the side in a clear area and fire a few shots. Then they're going to limber up, hitch up again, and continue down the road. And they're doing this at the speed that men are running. So this is very rapid. This is classic horse artillery. This is using horse artillery well. It is said that they advanced under a perfect storm of canister. And they're firing that um, canisters being fired, which is closer range at infantry. And then they're also starting to fire longer range projectiles at Union batteries further down the road, further down the attack path that are starting to engage. A Union soldier, First Sergeant James Peabody of the 61st Ohio said, it would not have been good generalship on my part to have stopped and made a close examination, so I followed the rest. You have Union troops fleeing in a panic, trying to get to the rear as this massive attack sweeps across the Union flank. On the screen, you can see what's known as the Bushbeck Line, which is where some Union regiments do stop. And you may be able to see, yep, there's an area on the screen that is marked yellow. And that is a preservation track that Central Virginia Battlefields Trust is working to preserve. They have named it the Beckham Track. And it is probably one of the rises of ground where Beckham places his guns. We know that he fires against the Bushbeck Line briefly. He describes it this way. When we reached a point about 1,200 yards from the entrenched position of the enemy on Chancellorsville Heights, our lines halted and the infantry fire ceased. A fire from our artillery was kept up for a short time, which caused all the enemy batteries in front and to our right to open upon us. I was satisfied that no good could result from replying with two or three guns to at least 20 and therefore directed the firing to be stopped. And it's in this advance that Beckham is part of that a high moment of praise for him happens. Next slide, please. Robert Beckham is personally complimented by General Stonewall Jackson. Now, Jackson likes artillery. He was an artillery officer in the Mexican-American War. Um, if he's not being a general on a battlefield, he's sometimes found playing with the artillery, which isn't always great leadership in his um, position and rank. But Jackson is very fond of the artillery. He's very fond of the Stuart horse artillery as well. <laughs> and he's interested to see how Beckham will perform in this new role. And at some point in this advance, Jackson rides up to Beckham and he says, young man, I congratulate you. And to Beckham, that is a high moment and high praise. Jackson rides on. The Confederate infantry attack begins to fall um, into disarray as they begin going through the woods and darkness is starting to settle in. Other artillery has come up. There were about 110 guns that were sent on the flank march. These are under command of Jackson's chief of artillery, Stapleton Crutchfield, and Beckham is going to retire from the field as these ba uh, more traditional batteries come into place and as the infantry is trying to figure out how to press their advance. Next slide, please. At this point, Beckham and his artillery take no part in the rest of the battle. They have had two men killed and five horses lost in the Battle of May 2nd. <coughs> Both Stuart and Lee are pleased with Beckham's performance, and he has proved himself as an able commander stepping into this role. They correspond about future promotion for him, and Beckham will go on to perform ably at Brandy Station, Gettysburg, and other battlefields. Later in the war, he will transfer out to the west where he'll be mortally wounded at Columbia, Tennessee on November 29, 1864, and he'll die December 5th, 1864. He's buried in St. John's Churchyard in Ashwood, Tennessee. So having concluded Beckham's story, and he is off the field as of the evening of May 2nd, 1863, right at the time that Justin Dimmick steps into the battle. Next slide. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dimmick's battery has moved from the river to the Chancellorsville Crossroads, the headquarters area, the heart of the Union lines around Chancellorsville. 
the commander of the artillery division, the second division that he's part of, Thomas Osborne, gives us a very vivid account of what happens. As we passed General Hooker's headquarters, a scene burst upon us, which God grant may never again be seen in the Federal Army of the United States. The 11th Corps had been routed and were fleeing to the river like scared sheep. Men and artillery filled the roads, and it appeared that no two of one company could be found together. Aghast and terror-stricken, heads bare and panting for breath, they pleaded that we would let them pass to the rear unhindered. The troops in the old division, unwavering, and the artillery, reckless of life and limb, passed through this disorganized mass of men. Reaching the crest of a hill, I left the batteries of Dimmick and Winslow on the brow, taking a position perpendicular to the road, Dimmick taking the right, excepting one section of Dimmick's battery, which I took about 400 yards to the front on a line with the front of the woods, and only a few yards in the rear of our line of battle. So what's happening is there's a new line trying to be established around the perimeter in this area around the Chancellorsville crossroads. And Dimmick's battery is part of that. So as the 11th Corps flees in the face of Jackson's attack, there's new infantry, the 3rd Corps and other units, and more artillery coming in to form a line and see if they can salvage the day and the battle for the Union cause. As Jackson's attack falls into disarray and they need to reorganize with the coming of dark, a level of quiet, at least comparative quiet, starts to settle over the battlefield. But Dimmick can hear Confederates out in his front. And at one point, Thomas Osborne, Dimmick's commander, sees a column of Confederate infantry moving in the darkness. He says, I directed Lieutenant Dimmick to open with canister, clearing the road almost instantly. Dimmick is going to be part of the artillery that fires out into the woods and along the Orange Turnpike at the same time that Confederate General Stonewall Jackson has been wounded. So Jackson rides out in front of his lines, and as he tries to return, he's wounded by friendly fire. That firing, the friendly fire of the Confederates, attracts the attention of the Union troops and Union artillery in the area, and they start lobbing artillery shells into the area. Some of those shells, some of those projectiles, are coming from Dimmick's guns as staff officers and uh, medical personnel try to remove St General Jackson from that battle area. The artillery is making it difficult for them. Thomas Osborne praises his artillery on the evening of May 2nd. He says the practice of artillery, and he doesn't mean they're practicing on a parade field, he means the, the doing, the, the practice of artillery this evening was the most splendid I ever saw. And then he particularly notes that with the accuracy that the gunners and their officers are able to achieve, he doesn't believe that any of their projectiles turned into friendly fire for federal troops. Next slide, please. Morning comes, May 3rd, 1863, and you can see, if you're looking at that part in the center of the map, the Union lines have really collapsed. They are forced together. The Confederate army, though, is divided, and they're going to, the Confederates will have to fight to reunite Jackson's attacking column with the rest of Lee's army. And it's in this fight that begins to center around the area of Fairview, around the area of the Chancellorsville Crossroads, that we find the heavy fighting of the day. Excuse me, of the day. One man will fall every second for the morning of May 3rd at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And we find Justin Dimmick at the center of it an artillery platform, so to speak, a, a feature of land that is perfect for artillery, known as Fairview, is given up by the Union Army. The Confederates will seize it and move their artillery into position, opening batteries on the Union lines and the Union guns. But before that happens, early in the morning, we find a little bit more about Justin Dimmick. Next slide. He is at his post of duty. And again, according to his division commander, at 5 o'clock in the morning of May 3rd, the enemy attacked us in force. And after a very severe fight by our men, the federal line began to fall back. 
in the movement of this section, securing and defending the front of our line from persistent attacks of the enemy, notwithstanding its own exposed condition and under a most galling fire from the rebel sharpshooters and line of battle, Lieutenant Dimmick showed the skill and judgment of an accomplished artillery officer and the intrepid bravery of the truest soldier. After holding this position for upward of an hour, his men fighting bravely, but falling rapidly round him, his horse being shot under him, and our infantry crowding back until his flanks or sides were exposed, I gave him the order to limber and fall back. In doing this, his horses became entangled in the harness, and in freeing them, he received a shot in the foot. This wound, <coughs> this wound he hid from his men but in a moment received one in the spine. Dimmick is mortally wounded here on the battlefield at Chancellorsville, but he is not captured, which gives us a clue that his men helped to remove him from the battlefield. The Union lines continue to collapse on May 3rd, 1863, and ultimately the Union Army will be forced to retreat across the river, losing the Battle of Chancellorsville. Other fighting battle at uh, Second Battle of Fredericksburg and the fighting around Salem Church occurred further east. Um, that Union force is also turned back by Confederates, and Joseph Hooker is forced to take his army back across the Rappahannock River. While these movements are happening, Justin Dimmick has his last days on earth. He dies on May 5th, 1863. A chief of artillery for the Third Corps writes, I regret to report the death of Lieutenant Dimmick, commanding Battery H, 1st U.S. Artillery. Captain Osborne, who was his immediate commander and an eyewitness, <laughs> characterizes the conduct of Lieutenant Dimmick as heroic. His remains were returned to his family and he was buried in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Next slide. In their after action reports, quite a few officers mention Dimmick. For example, Dan Sickles, commander of the Third Corps, says my artillery was served with uniform ability and power that to discriminate among the battery commanders is not a little embarrassing. He lists some of the other ones, and then he says, Dimmick won the applause of commanders and comrades by his heroic conduct. Brigadier General Joseph Carr writes quite a bit about Dimmick, but this uh, tribute stands out. The artillery arm has lost one of its most promising officers. And finally, his immediate commander, Thomas Osborne, writes, I would, if possible, here pay a slight tribute to his memory, but I cannot. He was an educated and accomplished officer, just budding into the full vigor of manhood. And as a line officer, he has shown fine abilities, and on the battlefield was unsurpassed for gallantry. Next slide. The Battle of Chancellorsville tested thousands of soldiers and officers. Each one experienced something similar, but in different ways. They experienced things as part of a group. They experienced things as individuals. Battle could make or break a reputation, especially for officers. Both Beckham and Dimmick led well at Chancellorsville, and their reputations were on the line. For Beckham, he built and solidified his reputation on May 1st and 2nd as he sent guns of the horse artillery into a large-scale battle for the first time under his command. He won the praise of Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Stewart, and Robert E. Lee. He also secured a place in the accounts of the famed flank attack as the commander of the two advance guns. Beckham would go on to greater success in horse artillery command, especially a few weeks later at the Battle of Brandy Station. Justin Dimmick died as a result of the Battle of Chancellorsville, but something profound happened in the posthumous commendations of his battlefield action. No one praises or even mentions his father and his father's connection to him in these battle reports. No one makes comments about his West Point dismissals. Dimmick had become a skilled leader in his peer group in the eyes of the men that he led and those that observed his leadership. His men stayed with him under fire and they probably carried him from the battlefield. And even when we don't have all the details of a soldier's life or battle experience, it is still valuable to examine his life. The accounts of Beckham and Dimmick are just two stories pulled from the reports and the records of history. 
but they serve as a reminder that when we look at large battles of the Civil War, we are not just looking at troop lines on a map. We are looking at the lives, the courage, and the reputations of the men and officers represented by those lines or artillery positions on the map. Thank you. I think we do have some time for questions if those are if you are interested. All right. So the as the person carrying around the microphone that's going to get to you when you raise your hand, uh, I have the distinction of asking the first question. Sarah, any idea or is there consensus of which of the two men was the better artillery person? Ooh, so if I, under, if I heard the question correctly, which was the artiller, better artilleryman? Well, I think we do have to point out that Beckham has the higher rank. Beckham is commanding more batteries. Um, Dimmick is commanding one battery, so that is one thing to keep in mind. We're kind of looking at different levels here of command, and it's also a different fighting style. So I'm conflicted if we can really compare them that way. And I know I might be beating around the bush with that question, but we do have Beckham with a bigger command and using horse artillery tactics. We have Dimmick with a smaller command, one battery, about six guns, and his tactics are going to be different. Um, I am very impressed by what Dimmick does um, on the road, helping to guard that road as long as possible for the Union Army. But what Beckham does is pretty incredible as well. So that's a hard question. Hey. Questions? Anybody? Questions going once? Here we go, here we go, I'm getting to you. Hold on. Who had that question? My question is, how old were um, Justin and Rob when they fought in this battle? Absolutely, great question. So Beckham is born May 6th, 1837. So you're gonna make me do math here. <laughs> He is 24, I believe, and Dimmick is 23. So early 20s. We're, we're talking about junior officers here and that chance to rise up in the ranks if possible. Was there a difference between a field artillery piece and a horse-drawn artillery piece? question. Um, technically, not really. It's more of how it's going to be used. The horse artillery wants lighter pieces of field artillery, but when Pelham is putting the battery together in 1861, 1862, he is doing it with captured artillery pieces. So some of it's going to be how they are then uh, harnessed um, and also looking to use those lighter guns. So Pelham will use a 12-pound Napoleon. Um, Beckham actually makes the decision after Chancellorsville to retire some of the what he calls heavier guns because the horses are not strong enough or healthy enough to pull them. So they are using guns that you would see. There's Blakely's, there's Napoleon's. It's more of the tactics that they're using. The weaponry is fairly similar. Great question. I see one in the back. Somebody talked up there, I didn't know. Okay, a um, couple of questions here. First of all, normal standard battery is six guns. So uh, when we're operating on this uh, right now, we're talking about in the horse artillery, were they dealing with a six gun battery? I think I'm hearing the question. It's kind of hard to hear up here. So I think the question was about how many guns in the horse artillery. Can you, okay, I'm seeing you nodding. Um, so they're gonna vary between generally four to six. A lot of the records, well, almost all the records of the Stuart horse artillery are lost. So sometimes we're making guesses or looking at the battle reports and trying to piece it together instead of having the ordnance records. Um, but yes, 
Generally, they're going to be a six gun. What they'll do, though, is they'll detach. So Beckham has pulled a couple of guns from one of his batteries. He's going to personally command them with that captain, and that's going to be the ones advancing at Chancellorsville. And that's pretty typical of the horse artillery. They, they'll have their battery, but then they're going to detach a gun for a specific duty. They're generally not taking like four or six guns into those advanced positions. It's usually just one or two pieces going out there. Basically, is moving a platoon. All right, so question, the leather one I had, is uh, when you start talking about Demick's location, where they actually uh, were, you know, their position, if you will, um, and I've been to Chancellorville many times. I was down at Quantico Station there. So the bottom line here is when you start to deal with that, that area, they've got a couple of howitzers out there right now. Two Napoleons are sitting out at that crossroad. Is that where Demick was? You know, when you have the old, the, uh, they have the Chancellorville Tavern area there at the crossroad. Is that the same area we're talking about? So, again, I'm sorry, I'm having a really hard time hearing from the audience. The, but I think I've got the question. Um, the area that Dimmick is going to be going in is around the Chancellorsville crossroads where the ruins of the house is located. Is that what we're talking about? Okay. And then um, for Beckham, basically you just follow Jackson's attack route on Route 3, the Orange Turnpike. Um, so moving, of course, west to east because he's basically along the road there, sometimes pulling off, sometimes using some high ground to his advantage. Um, the area that was on the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust map, and that is available online, um, that is right where the Orange Plank Road meets Route 3, or Route 20 meets Route 3. That's right in the area where they're working to preserve, and that's what's been named the Beckham Track. We have uh, time for one more question before Sarah walks down the stage, comes down to the table, and autographs the books that you want to buy. So last question. So did, uh, do we know whether Beckham and Dimmick ever met, and did they ever fire on each other's positions at Chancellorsville? That is a question that I wish I had a really clear answer on. Um, we do know that Dimmick, with moving out and firing toward the west, he's definitely firing in the direction where Beckham is. My feeling at the moment is Beckham is probably retiring from the field or has already left by the time that Dimmick actually comes into position and is starting to fire. But it's to me, it's fascinating to think that here, at kind of opposite ends of the Orange Turnpike, you've got these young artillery officers who have a West Point connection. They were at West Point at the same time, the different classes, of course. Um, and they're artillerymen, they're on different sides of the road, but that road is kind of that connector for them. Um, I wish I had a clear answer as to this was the exact time that Beckham fired his last shot. This is the first time that, you know, Dimmick fires at Chancellorsville. But they are definitely got cannons pointing at each other. But did they actually fire on each other? That is a question. And with that, uh, if you have another question, come on down here. But let's give a round of applause for a wonderful presentation for tonight.